evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, probably, for most of you. All right, got a new court filing in the Delphi case. <laughs> oh, it never stops. It never stops. Now, I haven't actually read this. So you're getting my reaction, my true and first reaction to this. Someone said in the chat, I think it was Dawn, said this is... Uh, uh the document is mind blowing says dawn well let's uh let's see let's see how mind blowing it is but before we jump into it just to give people a chance to come in let's remind ourselves of this shall we for you guys to start being journalists before an angry andrew baldwin left the courthouse 13 news overheard him speaking to richard allen's wife saying it ain't over the world's watching the world sees what's going on Why did it freeze? Why is it frozen? <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Huh. Why did that freeze? That's weird. Well, I'm going to play it again and see if it freezes again. You did hear it, though, didn't you? You did hear it until it froze. Does Michelle ever sleep? It's only uh, eight o'clock in the PM. It's not really bedtime yet. But yes, I do sleep. I sleep a lot, actually. You didn't hear any audio. I'm getting a yes and I'm getting a no. The world is listening. <laughs> I'm still getting yeses and then I'm getting no sound and then I'm getting yes, we heard it. All right, we're going to play it again. You may hear it, you may not. I think you'll hear it. I think you'll hear it. But anyway, let's play it again. Going back to the beginning. Huh. It doesn't like it. it doesn't like it. It's just giving me a black screen now. This is StreamYard's fault, not mine. It's, StreamYard has a problem with um, it's. Um, it gives you an option to add in a video that you can just play, and it very often goes wrong. But anyway, all right, we'll remove that, and we'll go back to this, and we'll just we'll just uh, just ignore what StreamYard just did. Computer says no. Yeah, we went dark. <laughs> It's Francis Gull. She doesn't want any more of this. She's denied it. She's denied. She's denied the motion to play the video. <laughs> anyway, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm not expecting this live to be terribly busy because there's about five gazillion people live right now talking about Stefan Stearns' 60 new charges. None of them murder but all of them heinous. But I'm booking the trend and I'm sticking with Delphi. So this is motion to compel and request for sanctions. So this is the defence from uh, Richard Allen's camp wanting the state to be sanctioned and to compel them uh, to give the defence, the information that they believe they are hiding. So again, I haven't read this. I've actually read the first paragraph. <laughs> so <laughs> mm. 
Gull has had enough exposure. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think she's had nearly enough exposure. All right. Comes now the accused Richard Allen by and through counsel, Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rosie, moves this court to compel the state of Indiana to provide certain discovery that the defence believes exists, but that the state of Indiana has not provided to the defence. Additionally, the defence seeks sanctions against the state of Indiana for a variety of discovery violations detailed herein. The sanction requested is simply that any delay in the trial created by the state's violation of rules of discovery uh, be assessed against the state of Indiana. In support of said motion, the accused states the following. All right, so not calling for the state to be disqualified or anything like that. It's just, um, you know, if you try to de delay the trial, with any dirty tactics, you know, like hiding discovery and stuff, we're on it. We are watching. We're all watching. All right. So, number one, the defense, as we just, I just want it like that. That'll do. All right. The defense has attempted to cooperate with the state of Indiana in order to comply with the spirit of local rule. 08CR0018, which is attached and marked as Defence Exhibit A, for the sole purpose of assisting the court and supplementing this motion to compel. So I haven't looked up that rule, but I'll believe them. Pursuant to the local rule, the state of Indiana shall disclose and furnish all relevant items and information under the rule to the defendant within 30 days from the date of the appearance, subject to constitutional limitations and other limitations, and the defence shall provide the same within 30 days of the state providing its evidence. So remember, the clock is ticking to the um, 13th of May. What's happening on the 13th of May, everybody? <laughs> the trial starts on the 13th of May. It's to run three weeks. So starting on the 13th, ending on the 31st. So people are saying it's only two weeks, only two weeks. It's not. It's three weeks. If you look at the calendar, it's actually three weeks. But, you know, there's jury selection and stuff. So, yeah. So the clock is ticking. So, you know... Nick tries to, uh, you know, these little delaying tactics and saying, oh, oh, Francis, Francis, we need to, we need to, we need a continuance. The defence says no, not continuance, no. All right, pursuant to said local rule, the party seeking disclosure of evidence shall include in the party's motion or request a statement showing that the attorney making the motion or request has made a reasonable effort to reach agreement with opposing counsel concerning matters set forth in the motion or request, including date, time, place and manner of this effort to reach an agreement. To this day, the state of Indiana continues to provide late discovery of items and information that it was required to provide no later than December 14th, 2022. <laughs> Pursuant to local rule. Well, you're only, you're only 15 months late. Come on. Give him a bit of leeway here. <laughs> For example... On February 20th, 2024, the defence sent a certified letter to the prosecutor's office seeking many pieces of evidence, over 20, that the defence believes exists, but it appears that the state of Indiana has failed to turn over to the defence. Let's wait and see. In that certified letter, the defence requested a determination if said evidence exists, and if so, to determine if that evidence has been turned over to the defence, as the defence was unable to locate any of the aforementioned evidence 
and the vast amount of discovery provided by the state of Indiana. All right, so they've got a vast amount of discovery, but they believe there's more. They believe there's um, gaps, holes, things maybe intentionally omitted for some reason. In other words, the defence is seeking clarity as to whether the prosecution has turned over certain evidence or whether said evidence even exists. So they're just seeking clarification. So Nick can just say, no, it doesn't exist. doesn't exist. You're just dreaming. You're dreaming. And then Gull can come along and go, deny, 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 as always. The state of Indiana did not respond to the letter, but rather sent one E discovery strand, which contained a small portion of that evidence requested. So there is more. Because Nick is like, oh, I've sent it all. I've sent it all. You've got it all. But yeah, they've now got this little tantalizing piece of extra information. So the state obviously does have more. All right including certain videotaped interviews that has never been turned over, involving people integral to the timeline. <laughs> what? <laughs> so Nick can't come along and say, oh, <laughs> oh, no, you've got it all. <laughs> when, when, when the... the, the when the, the, the defence still doesn't have all the interviews that were conducted, what, right at the beginning? <laughs> Integral to the timeline. The state of Indiana turned over these pieces of evidence more than 14 months late, pursuant to local rule, without explanation. Am I okay? Yes, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> I might not be okay by the end of this, though, so ask me again later. Pursuant to the local rule, the defence is not required to make specific requests of any evidence, as the state of Indiana is required to turn over all relevant items. Yet, without making the specific request, it appears that the defence would never have received these most recent pieces of evidence i.e. the videotaped interviews of certain witnesses. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, that's right, Spanish Angel. Some of the interviews got destroyed. <laughs> yeah, that... Um... <laughs> <laughs> that, that drive that was, um, oh, just written over because someone left it running. You know, they left the tape running. So it overrode. Once it filled up, it overrode itself with white noise because someone left it running. So all the interviews conducted, allegedly, conducted before February 20th, 2017. So the very first week of the investigation, Abby and Libby were murdered on the 13th, the bodies were found on the 14th, and the interviews up to, so these, these would have been really important interviews, were all written over, including Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall. Fancy that. Did a live stream on that a little while ago. Go back and listen. The frustration from the defence is that this is not the first time that the defence has had to make specific requests for specific evidence that the state has failed to turn over to the defence. Yeah, policing 101. Yeah, they, they, they didn't pass that class. No. They, they, they got a zero for that class. Leave tape record running. Tick. Yeah, I, I, I honestly don't believe, I honestly do not believe that. I do not believe it. I'll never be able to prove it, but I do not believe that happened. I totally don't believe it. 
Is Delphi celebrating Halloween early this year? Well, well, maybe. Catching up on 1.75. Ooh, that's good. All right. Because law enforcement and the prosecution are in total control of what evidence is ultimately turned over to the defence, the defence has no choice but to hope that the state of Indiana turns over all relevant evidence, especially exculpatory evidence. I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> I wouldn't hold it at all. Because you're going to be gasping before they'll turn over any potentially exculpatory evidence. The defence simply does not have the luxury of knowing what relevant stroke exculpatory evidence the state possesses and has turned over versus what relevant stroke exculpatory evidence that the state of Indiana possesses but has failed to turn over. Over the course of this case, the defence has learnt of certain evidence referenced in other discovered documents or mentioned from other sources or from exercising common sense that has caused it, the defence, to believe that said evidence does exist but that the prosecution has failed to turn over said evidence to the defence. And then the defence later determined that the prosecution did in fact possess those items but failed to turn those items over to the defence until requested to do so. Hmm. Now, you've got to remember that, you know, key players in law enforcement were deposed in August of last year. And then um, there was, what, three law enforcement officers deposed again at the beginning of this month. So you've got to remember that, what came out of the, those depositions. Okay, the history of the prosecution failing to turn over all relevant evidence to the defence has caused great concern to the defence. Yeah. Over the course of this case, many of the items that the state of Indiana has failed to provide to the defence in a timely manner are what the defence would label as major pieces of evidence, even exculpatory evidence. Many of the items that the state of Indiana failed to provide to the defence in a timely manner were only provided after the defence had specifically requested the items that it, the defence, came to learn existed, but the state of Indiana failed to turn over. That's somewhat repetitive. I, I, I don't think you need that. You've said that. Anyway, for example, one of the more important pieces of evidence in this case is the data retrieved from the phone found at the scene where the victims were found, as this piece of evidence contains data concerning the Down the Hill video and other important information. So this is Libby's phone. Right, so Libby's phone was found at the scene. And we've all heard the down the hill. Well, we've heard what three seconds, guys down the hill. We've heard three seconds. We've been told that the entire clip is 43 seconds. And we've been told that um, we can only have like three seconds of it. Right. Can't have any more. And then we get that, we get that moving, moving image of Bridge Guy which is like literally a second. Okay, so we all know what we're talking about here. So that's from Libby's form. Right. This form and the data contained on the form have been available since 2017. Yet the defense did not receive the data from that form by the deadline of December 14th, 2022, as designated by local rule. The defence, knowing that this evidence simply had to exist, <laughs> of course it goddamn exists. It's on the Idaho, uh, sorry, if I say Idaho, Indiana State Police's website, the Down the Hill video. You can download it from, from the Indiana State Police's website. You know, the, the three seconds that were allowed, of course, not the full 
43 seconds. So yes, of course it exists. We know it exists. <laughs> Can you believe that the, the what? All right. The defense, knowing this evidence simply had to exist, finally sent an email to the prosecutor on June 17th, 2023, requesting the data from several forms, including the form in question that belonged to Liberty German. The state of Indiana did not provide the form data from Liberty German's form until September 8th, 2023. Why? That would have been one of the very first pieces of evidence. <laughs> You've got the victim's form at the scene. That's the first piece of evidence they're going to send away to the lab, isn't it? What's on this form? Come on now. Nearly nine months after the state of Indiana should have turned over that evidence and nearly three months after the defence specifically requested that evidence, even though the defence is not required to make a specific request for relevant evidence. What? That's crazy. Most of the other items requested in that June 17th, 2023 email to the prosecution still, to this day, have not been turned over to the defence. That's crazy. This includes data, reports and other information relating to the images of the bridge purportedly taken on Liberty German's phone at 2.05 p.m. on February 13th, as well as an image of Abigail Williams walking on the bridge, taken on Libby's phone at 2.07, both purportedly sent through Snapchat. Well, we know they exist because we've all got them. We've all got them. So they're making an example of that, knowing full well that they exist, knowing full well that they're all over the all over the internet. So the one at two or five is just a shot that Libby took, sh looking straight down the bridge, like nobody's there, just shot straight down the bridge. And then the two or seven one is Abby walking on the bridge, so coming from the north to the south side. So we know they exist. So the defence is probably thinking, well, we know they exist because the internet's got them. Well, we haven't got this data. So what else was on that phone that we don't have? See where I'm going with that. The week of August 5th, 2023, the defence took several depositions. So I knew the depositions were going to be very relevant here. All right. The defence took several depositions. At the conclusion of that week, it became clear to the prosecution that the defence was pursuing information concerning certain Odinists that had been investigated by three law enforcement officers, Todd Click, Greg Ferenczi, who was shot to death, and Kevin Murphy, by an uh, apparently, allegedly, an ex-correctionals officer. I don't know whether there's any relevance to this case or not, or whether it's just a, you know, a, a, I don't know, complete, complete fluke, complete coincidence. On or about September 8th, 2023, nearly a month after said depositions, the prosecutor provided a daunting amount of newly discovered evidence, including a letter from Todd Click's lawyer discussing Click's concern essentially that the prosecution might be unaware of law enforcement's investigation into Brad Holder, Patrick Westfall, Elvis Fields and others. Click believed were more likely involved in the murders than Richard Allen. This letter and its contents were highly exculpatory. And we know that exists. All right. Upon receiving this missing evidence, the defence was surprised, struck, shocked to learn that on May the 1st, 2023, the prosecutor's office signed for the Todd Click letter and the exculpatory evidence and information contained in that letter, yet failed to alert the defence to the existence of this exculpatory discovery until after the prosecutor knew for certain that the defence would definitely be calling Todd Click in for 
future depositions, at which point in time the defence would most assuredly learn of the existence of this exculpatory evidence. So Nick knows that he's, um, you know, he's caught with his pants down, so to speak. Therefore, he's got to then start turning over stuff that he thought, oh, we could just we can just keep that in the, you know, the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet. No one's ever going to know about that. No, never going to know about that. And then these depositions occur and, and he just thinks, shit. He thinks, holy hell, they're on to me. Oh, no. I better, um, better scramble here for some damage limitation. See what I can do. And then, oh, oh, a month later, guess what? Guess what Nick decided? He decided, oh, these, uh, this, this defence team, you know, they've been grossly negligent. Therefore, we're going to have them uh, disqualified. And then Gull said, yeah, OK. OK, Nick. Yes, I can do that. I can do that for you, son. I can do that. Mm. Interesting timing, don't you think? Yeah. All right. It took McClelland 131 days to turn over this exculpatory evidence. And it was only turned over after McClellan knew the defence would ultimately find out about the exculpatory evidence. Oh, dear. The prosecutor offered no explanation whatsoever as to why he had held on to exculpatory evidence for several months and only provided it to the defence once it became obvious that the defence would learn of the existence of that exculpatory evidence. Well, um, no, you don't, you don't want to explain why you've been caught with your pants down. It's probably very embarrassing, I would imagine. Never happened to me, but I would imagine. Not so slick, is he, really? No. Certainly, the defence would have been much further ahead in their defence of Richard Allen had the prosecutor turned over the click information in a timely manner. Yeah, well, you can now... You know, they've answered their own question <laughs> as to why this uh, exculpatory evidence wasn't turned over in a timely manner. I think we can all understand why. Certainly the defence would have been even more prepared for the August depositions had the prosecutor turned over that exculpatory evidence. Between September 8th, 2023 and October 6th, 2023, approximately 90 days before the January 2024 trial date had been set, the state of Indiana dumped 14 hard drives, five flash drives, one disk and certain e-discovery on the defence, including several videotaped interviews of third party suspects that the defence had focused on when deposing law enforcement in early August 2023. So all of that stuff has been sitting there in the prosecutor's office and hadn't been turned over until he knew he'd been caught. Thank you, RZ, for gifting one membership. Leah! Leah, welcome to memberships. You get a month's free Michelle After Dark memberships courtesy of RZTV. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. His license plate says the boss. He's a total narcissist. Is that true? <laughs> Does it really? <laughs> well, yeah, it should change it to um, the loser. Man, so 14 hard drives, five flash drives, one disk, and certain e-discovery. Uh, well, it depends how big they are, doesn't it? It really does say the boss. Oh, my. Oh, my word. That is... <laughs> the boss got owned. <laughs> totally. 
The state of Indiana provided no explanation whatsoever why they had not turned over to the defence this massive amount of evidence, exculpatory or not, nine months later than requested under the local rule, and a month after the prosecution learned that the defence was pursuing a defence. Look, it's not like they've got any excuse really, is it? Because the case, the case had been going on since 2017. You would think that by, you know, from February 2017 to October 2022, when they arrested Richard Allen, you'd think that they'd have all the, you know, the, the, all the stuff that they'd done to that point all catalogued. So all the basic stuff, like the, you know, initial interviews and, you know, the, the form data, forensic data, all that stuff would have been there done initially in the early days and would be sitting in a file waiting to be used when someone was arrested. There's, there's simply no excuse whatsoever. The only stuff that should they should have had to do is specifically pertaining to Richard Allen. That's the only stuff that they needed to do new. That's the only stuff that you would think, well, okay, I could understand why that may be delayed because, you know, once you start sending stuff off to a lab or, you know, you've got third parties involved that you, you have no control over their time frame, then you've got an understandable way sometimes, you know, it's not, you know, it's not your fault if the lab's backed up. You know, and you just have to go back and say, I'm sorry. Yeah, we know this is delayed because the lab hasn't got back to us yet. The lab's backed up. And then everybody just goes, oh, OK. And then they set a date for that, you know, evidence to come in. We've all seen all of this stuff. It all plays out. Every single trial, it plays out. There's always something that gets delayed. So you could understand it if it was stuff particularly pertaining to Richard Allen. You know, like I don't know, like sending his um, his phones off, or sending, you know, his um, boots off, or any evidence that they found in his house, whatever, right? His vehicle, whatever, all of that stuff that they collected when he was arrested. You can understand if that's the stuff that's delayed, because that's new. But the stuff that's been was surely would have been done in the first couple of months after the murders, that would be sitting there waiting. So all the interviews that were done, all the forensics that were done, the forms, everything that was done at the time would be sitting there waiting. There's no excuse. That could have been shipped over to the to the, the defense like within a week. Surely. But no, no. If on team member for 17 months, how can we see a fair trial with this judge? Well, remains to be seen. Except I don't think we will be seeing it. I've had a lot of people contact me, you know, asking, will will this trial be televised? And um, we don't know for sure yet. Because uh, Francis Gull wants media companies to put in requests every single time there's a hearing she doesn't want to make you know a judgment you know oh yeah cameras allowed or no cameras not allowed she wants to do it on a case by case or a hearing by hearing basis so we don't know yet but i would imagine very strongly that she will excuse me will not allow this trial to be televised i would i would I wouldn't quite so go so far as to say I'm going to bet my house on it. But I would imagine she's going to say, nah. Cameras, no, 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 no. And she'll probably say media not even allowed to text. So we won't get any correspondence whatsoever from anybody in the court. You know, people, I'm just taking my hoodie off here. Oh, dear. Um. People will probably have to leave their phones outside and they won't allow... You can just imagine that the courthouse will be on a complete lockdown. She won't want anything coming out from this trial. 
She really, really won't. Okay. All right. The state of Indiana provided no explanation whatsoever. Bonnie, thank you for joining. Welcome to the Secret Agents Club. Thank you, thank you. The state of Indiana provided no explanation whatsoever why they had not turned over to the defence this massive amount of evidence, exculpatory or not, nine months later than required under the local rule, and a month after the prosecution learned that the defence was pursuing a defence that certain third parties were involved in the murders. Much of this late discovery dash missing evidence pertained to the focus of law enforcement on certain suspects involved in Odinism. Well, wouldn't you just, wouldn't you just credit it? You know, oh no, 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 no. Can't have my friends, my fellow Mason, Brad Holder, brought into question. No, I know Brad, says Nick. Nick got his Master Mason degree from Tipton Lodge. Who's a, a senior steward at Tipton Lodge? Anybody? Woo. Ten memberships. Purple AJ coming in with the ten gifted memberships. Thank you so much. Who's got them? Sweet Peas. Oops, jumped here. Sweet Peas. Spanish Angel. Sweet Dude Shibby. Nursikins, Lemon Lime and Bittersweet, Dawn, Jen, Verita, Verita, Momo, oh no, sorry, I thought you got one more, more shot, but you're already a member, um, and My King of Kings, and Karen, I think that's it, I think that's it, thank you so much Purple Legit, welcome you guys, you get a month's free memberships, Abby has a form, no, Abby didn't have a form, no, Abby didn't have a phone, so it's just Libby, Libby's phone. Yes, Brad Holder. Brad Holder. I don't know whether he still is, but he certainly was at the time that Nicky got his um, Master Mason degree from there. He was a senior steward. So, hmm, secret handshakes in Tipton Lodge. If you don't believe me, I showed those screenshots many times in videos. Mm -hmm. Brother Nick. All right. It was apparent that had the defence not alerted the state of Indiana as to their strategy to pursue the Odinist angle in defending their client and therefore the likelihood that the defence would talk to Todd Click who would then reveal the existence of the letter. It is highly likely that the prosecutor would never have turned over that exculpatory evidence to the defence. I think that's a very, very good bet. No, he wouldn't. The very last discovered item that the defence received before the prosecutor requested that the defence be kicked off the case was geofencing evidence that the defence believes was received on October 6, 2023. This geofencing evidence was received nearly 10 months after the state was required to turn it over and contained what appeared to be highly exculpatory evidence concerning a variety of important matters, including the phone numbers of multiple people who appear to have either been at the crime scene are within 60 to 100 yards of the crime scene during the very times when the victims were purportedly being murdered, according to the state's timeline provided in the probable cause affidavit. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, multiple people who appear to be at the crime scene within 60 to 100 yards of the crime scene. Well, we do know that there were people around. We do know that there were people around. We don't know we don't know how many. We know some of the people who were around. Whoa. 
In this late discovery, the defence found a map prepared by someone, presumably law enforcement, that appears to track the movements of these people in and around the crime scene the afternoon of December 13th. That should be February. Come on. That should be February. Surely that should be February. February 13th, 2017. Anyhow, we'll uh, we'll correct that typo. So right, I've got I've got to read this slowly now. I've got, I'm getting very 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 concerned now. In this late discovery, the defence found a map prepared by someone, presumably law enforcement, that appears to track the movements of these people in and around the crime scene the afternoon of February 13th, including between 3.02 and 3.27, at or very near the location within 60 to 100 yards of where the bodies were ultimately found the following day. Whoa. Whoa. Yes, Spanish Angel, you don't think, could be very important. Of course it could. All right, hold on. Okay, all right. We're, get, we're, we're getting, we're getting, getting serious now. We're getting the map out. We're getting the map out, guys. All right, we're firing up Google Earth. Firing up Google Earth here. Check your comment, Fluffy Bunny. Hold on. Michelle, check my comment. I'll try. Do you know what I want YouTube to do? I want I want it to give a search feature. So YouTube, if you're listening, so that I can search for all the comments made by a specific person. So if you're listening, YouTube, that would be really useful because I have to scroll up to try and find Fluffy Bunny's comment. Michelle, continue reading reforms. Just let me. I, I've got to do this for my own for my own sanity. So I'm just going to fire up Google Earth, and I'm just going to look what sixty to hundred yards looks like on the map, and then I'll go back. I'll go straight back to reading. Just a second. Got to find Morn and Highbridge because I've got all these. I've got all these uh, pins. Got all these pins. All right, here we go. All right, and I've now got to share my entire screen because Google Earth doesn't show up weirdly, doesn't show up as a window. So I've got to do it another way. All right, so, so we've got all these pins here. All right. Okay. All right, so just for orientation purposes, this is the bridge, all right? So I've got all these, Got all these pins so that's where bg was towards the south side of the bridge so the bridge runs from here over deer creek and then all the way to here so the girls were told to go down the hill so they went down here now i don't know exactly where the crime scene was but it's somewhere on the banks of the north bank around here it might be a little bit over there actually might have that pin a little bit wrong. However, um, let's do a hundred yards from this from this spot here. It's just a uh, rough and ready. All right. Because I think that pin needs to be more there. All right. So we're gonna do a hundred yards from. Can't see that, can you? Right. 
So there's 100 yards. That's 100 yards. So... So it's really, it's not even from that spot, which may be slightly wrong, but it's not, it's not even a hundred yards. Like from there to the bridge, you're looking at 160 yards. And again, that might be slightly wrong. So 60 yards, you're looking at the other side of the creek. If you were stood at the back at the at the south side of the banks of the creek, that's 60 yards from the crime scene. So if you were walking, like you took a walk down the banks, because there is a trail that can that takes you down to the banks. So you can't actually walk uh, uh, like on the bank of Deer Creek. So if you were walking on that bank, then uh, if you were on the south side and you were walking along here, you'd be about 60 yards from that crime scene. Maybe a little more if the crime scene is a little bit more up there, as I think it might be. So that's really not very far at all, is it? That really is not very far at all. And we do know that there is a, a phone mast close to here. So it's, it's not like this is in the middle of absolutely nowhere where you've not got a phone mast for, for miles so that any any pings you get off it you know you're thinking well maybe it's inaccurate no there's a foam mast right close to this bridge oh it's much less than a football field yeah that's just crazy that's insane that is absolutely insane. All right. Let's get back to this. Lead with love. Thank you for joining. Welcome to Secret Agents Club. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I just needed to do that just to just to get a feel for. Right. All right. Since their return to Richard Allen's defence, Allen's attorneys have specifically requested via email, February 26, 2024, that the state of Indiana provide all narrative reports relating to the geofencing data, as well as all the documents related to the geofencing data. But the state of Indiana so far has claimed that no such documents exist. This sounds very much like, oh, oh, no, no, the professor, the professor, the expert, the Purdue professor, the expert in ordinism. No, 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 we, we, we don't have a report for him. No, a report doesn't exist for him. Oh, well, can you give me the name of the professor and we can, you know, contact Purdue University and contact that professor. No, I can't remember. I can't remember his name. Can't remember that guy's name. Can you remember? No, I can't remember either. Jesus Christ. Jesus, Mary and all the flaming saints. Can you come down and help? Can you just all like Odin, you, you come as well. Come on. Come on, Thor. You come as well. I, I just need I just need all the divine intervention now to help me through this because this is insane. What else are they hiding? Well, I could imagine they're probably hiding the fact that Richard Allen's phone wasn't wasn't one of these numbers that they were tracking. 
because if it's true that Richard Allen left the scene before the murders took place, his phone wouldn't have been involved in this geofencing. He would have been and gone. They'd have seen the phone leaving the scene. That's what it is. That's what it is. I bet you any money that's what it is. Wow. Because you could tell, you could tell if he turned his phone off because it would just disappear. So, you know, they'd be tracing it along, tracing it along, tracing it along, and then it would just disappear. So, you know, it's either run out of battery or it's been turned off, right? But if you see the phone, go to the bridge, stand on platform one, because he said he was watching the fish, and then turn back round and go back up towards the Freedom Bridge, well, it's left the scene. So it's not like he's going to walk and then come back and then turn his phone off and then and then come back again, is he? No, he's left the scene. And if you continue to trace that phone, it would have left the complete area. Now, it's too late to go back and do that now. But I bet you any money, I bet you any money, that's why. Because, listen. If Richard Allen's phone, I mean, they may not have known it belonged to him at the time when this geofencing stuff was done. But <laughs> as soon as they arrested him and they said, well, they did know his phone. They did know his phone because they interviewed him in February. So they did know his phone number, didn't they? They knew his phone number because Dan Dullard got the phone thing the you know the unique identifier of the phone is what is it i i m e something we know his phone we know the phone that he had in february 2020 uh, sorry 2017 no way no freaking way look I could cry for this guy. I could I could honestly cry for this guy now. Whoa, lead with love has gifted 10 memberships. Thank you so much. Who's got them? Yaya, Fian X, Marissa, BG, OG. <laughs> uh, oh, I nearly say Holly, but you're already found a scapegoat. They did, but they didn't think it through, did they? Sugar Magnolia, they just assumed that all oh, these public defenders will come along, you know, they take the money, they don't really do very much work, you know, the state puppets really, yeah, but they didn't bank on these guys actually doing their job. Lindsay Mothman Malligator, woohoo. Do you have a Belgian Malinois by any chance? Uh, Chris and Betsy's Barn. You guys, welcome to memberships for a month free, courtesy of, courtesy of Lead With Love. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. All right. So they knew Richard Allen's phone number in February 2017. But they lost, they lost the, you know, Dan Dullard. He, he made some notes and then thought he'd recorded it, but he, but he hadn't anyway. He'll keep looking. But he did make some notes. We know he made notes. We know he took Richard Allen's phone number, that, like literally days after the murders. So whoever did this geofencing and they were following these phones around the area, surely they would have looked up those phone numbers and, you know, been able to put names to them. Well, one of them would have been Richard Allen's because 
they've already got his phone number on file. They've got his phone number on file because he came forward. So now they've got Richard Allen's phone. Well, if, if the killer really was Richard Allen, then they'd have had that phone at that very time the murders took place, go across the bridge, go down the hill, go up the other side, stay there for a little while while he did the murders, and then leave the scene. Or it would just suddenly disappear because he might have turned his phone off once he got some victims in his sights. He thought, oh, that turned my phone off. Don't want to be disturbed. But no, 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 no. If they had that information, wouldn't that be in the PCA? Wouldn't that be the first thing they'd have put in the PCA? <laughs> it's like we've got the guy's phone pinned to the crime scene at the very time. No, no mention, no mention of Richard Allen's phone in the PCA, which leads me to believe <laughs> that Richard Allen's phone was not found during this geofencing exercise. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. All right. <clears throat> I mean, just to say the reports don't exist. Right, somebody has had to produce the geofencing. And every time someone does some work on a case, what do they do? They do a report. They do a narrative report. You know, it's just like, you know, writing what you've done, explaining what you've done. So... To say that there's no reports connected to this geofencing exercise is, is a ridiculous, an absolutely ridiculous thing to say. It's, it's an even worse excuse than the hamster ate my homework. It's the equivalent of the hamster ate my homework. It really is. Again, the defence is at the mercy. Uh, God. All right. As it relates to the geofencing evidence, it would be shocking that law enforcement would take the time to put a map together, tracking the movements of certain phones in and around the crime scene between 12.39 and 54 seconds. So they've been that precise. They've been that precise. 12 39 and 54 seconds and 5 49 and 6 seconds on february 13th 2017 but they're not follow up with detailed narrative reports concerning the geofencing analysis of that data there'd be analysis reports there'd be every single officer that is connected to a function relating to a case has a report to write. Seriously, to say that there's no reports is utterly crazy, bizarre. He might as well write, yeah, we did have them, but the hamster ate them. We have an office hamster that gets out in the night, and I'm really sorry, but he ate all the reports relating to the geofencing. They might as well just say that. That's more believable. Quite frankly, having, you know, shared my life with various hamsters over the years, that's very believable. Mm. Mm. I had a hamster. Sidebar. Just to, let's just take the, take the tone down a, a notch or two. I had a hamster when I was a teenager. And I was growing sunflowers. Right? So I got some seeds. And I was growing them in my in my windowsill, right? So you know, when once they they got you know big, I was going to put them in the in the garden. My hamster, who was called Benny, got out in the night as he often did. Guess what he did? He ate every single one of my plants. Every single one was gone in the morning. 
and he'd gone back to bed. So we'd gone out, because <laughs> they're nocturnal. So he waited for me to go to sleep. He got out, had a rummage around my room, got into my windowsill, ate all my plants, and then went to bed. Can you believe that? Yeah. There's an interesting story with between... <laughs> <laughs> Tilly was terrified. The last hamster I had, Tilly was Tilly was here. Right, Tilly's nearly eight. Right, so this hamster when Tilly was young, and um, that hamster used to get out. I didn't mind. I don't mind rodents getting out. Like like he had uh, Louis King Louis. I called him King Louis. Had this castle, like this massive castle that I made for him. Right, huge, like proper habitat. Like it was meant to be as big as a hamster's territory in the wild, right? But he still used to get out, have a rummage around and then go back to bed. And I didn't mind it, right? He, he could get out. One night I woke up at like two o'clock in the morning with Tilly going absolutely berserk. Tilly and Bella going absolutely berserk. Bella, tried because Bella was a, a terrier, Right, trying to literally dig under a bookcase. The thing that woke me up, though, was Tilly had literally jumped on my bed and was trying to hide behind me. Right. So, <laughs> so I, I, I got Bella out of the room. And then called the hamster because he would he would just come to me. Called the hamster, and he was wet, and like really wet, uh, with like dog saliva. So do you know what I think happened? I think Tilly tried to swallow him, and he bit her tongue. That's what I think happened, and that's what the holy hell commotion was. <laughs> And ever since that time, right, the hamster was absolutely gunning. Every time the hamster was awake and Tilly came into the room, he'd bomb it to the front of his habitat and try to get out to her. Like, he really had it in for her. And Tilly was absolutely terrified, terrified. When she saw him, like, trying to get out, she would hide behind me. And you, you know how big Tilly is, and you know how small a hamster is. Absolutely hilarious. Hilarious. Anyway, right, back to this. Back to this. So, yeah, the I could believe it if Nick had wrote in this, you know, if he wrote to the defence saying, really sorry, yeah, we did have those reports. However, the office hamster ate them. I could, I could believe that, right. But what I can't believe is they do not exist. That's absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. All right. Yeah, the prosecution claims no such geofencing reports exist. However, the defence has heard this type of answer from the prosecution in the past, only to learn that the prosecutor's claims that documents did not exist weren't true. Excuse me. Within the last two weeks, the defence deposed the state's phone dump expert. <laughs> oh, no way. Who was Dawn at the beginning said this was mind blowing. No way. Within the last two weeks, the defence deposed the state's phone dump expert, who presumably will be testifying concerning the data found on Liberty German's phone. Before that deposition, the defence had emailed the prosecution on February 26, 2024, seeking reports related to the form dump of that particular form in order to prepare for said deposition. The prosecution responded to the defence, claiming that there were no reports related to the form dump from the expert. <laughs> Come on now. Then at the deposition, minutes before the deposition began, the prosecutor handed over two to three pages of notes that the state's phone dump expert had made. 
providing the defence zero time to review as part of its preparation for the deposition and providing no opportunity for the defence to meet with its own technology expert in order to learn what questions would be wise to ask the state's expert at said deposition. This is just dirty tactics. The only way he can win is if he plays dirty. It's Slick Nick's Dirty Tricks. I, I, I had a video, I called a video of that the other day. It's exactly what they say. It's Dirty Tricks. Dirty Tricks. The prosecutor handed over these notes without explanation and with no apparent reasons as to why the prosecutor had previously told the defence that no such document exists, when in fact they did. Seriously, if this judge was fair and unbiased, this prosecutor should be off this case. Seriously. Seriously. Unbelievable. The prosecutor's denial of the existence of certain documents regarding the phone dump before the deposition, followed by the unexplained production of certain documents within minutes of the deposition sadly was not surprising but highlights once again the less than forthright style in which the prosecution has been turning over evidence to the defence dating back to the beginning of the case. Crazy. Furthermore, because of the lack of candor concerning the existence or non-existence of certain evidence, the defence cannot be sure whether certain documentation exists concerning geofencing analysis, even though the prosecution is claiming that no such documents exist. Well, they do exist. They do exist. They're just exculpatory. That's why they're not including them. That's why they're just ignoring the possibility that, you know, oh, no, don't exist, don't exist. Since rejoining the case, the defence has sought out the names of the geofencing experts who analysed the geofencing evidence for purpose of preparing for depositions to determine if the state's expert has an explanation as to why the geofencing evidence displays what appears to be extremely exculpatory evidence of people walking in and around the crime scene during times when law enforcement is claiming that the murders were taking place. At first, the prosecutor refused to provide the names of his experts, but then told the defence he would ask the, his investigator. Oh, I can't remember. Can't remember. Can you remember? No, I, I can't remember either. All right. Again, specifically, someone prepared a map which tracked the February 13th, 2017 afternoon movements of multiple phones in and around the place where the victims were ultimately found the following day. Particularly, some of these movements appear to have occurred between 3.02 and 3.27 p.m., either at the scene where the victims were ultimately found on February 14th or within 60 to 100 yards from that site. And none of the phones or people associated with the phones have any affiliation with Richard Allen. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. Wow. I just got it for him. Following the request for the identity of the geofencing experts, the prosecution claimed they had no idea who analysed the geofencing data. But then the state of Indiana provided the names of four people that may have been called as state's expert witnesses on geofencing. Nor were in discovery as the defence located any narrative reports or other documentation or analysis of the geofencing data from any of the four identified state geofencing experts. Nor were in discovery as the defence found any documentation uh, negating the defence's analysis that the geofencing evidence shows multiple people were found in and near the crime scene at the time when law enforcement claims the murders were occurring. Additionally, 
The defense has reviewed all discovery provided by the state of Indiana and has not yet found a single interview of any of the people whose forms, according the, to the geofencing data, were found the afternoon of February 20. Oh, no. So they've not interviewed the people whose phones were at the scene. Oh, they probably have. And they're either exculpatory, therefore they're hidden in a file drawer somewhere, or there may have been some of those that were lost when they left the tape running. Crazy. This is so bad. This is so bad. I can't even be snarky about this now. This is just really sad. There's a man being tortured in a in a prison cell. I can't I can't even I, I don't even have the will to be snarky right now. It's so sad. Additionally, the defence has reviewed all discovery provided by the state of Indiana and has not yet found a single interview of any of the people whose phones, according to the geofencing data, were found the afternoon of February 13th. That should be 2017. Moving in or around the location where the bodies were ultimately found the following day at times when the murders would have taken place according to law enforcement timeline. The defence did locate very limited background information concerning one of the owners of one of the phones, but did not locate any narrative reports, interviews or notes concerning the owner of that phone. It would be shocking if the owner of those phones were not interviewed when their movements were tracked. Well, absolutely. Why would you bother tracking phones if you don't intend to follow up on the witnesses? Of course you're going to follow up on the witnesses because any one of them was the murderer, potentially. Unless the murderer turned the phone off and everybody else is just wandering about going for a walk. But why, Why if they're that close to the crime scene, why did they not hear anything? Why did they not see anything? Even if, you know, the girls were at gunpoint and, and were too terrified to scream or don't scream, no one saw anything no one 60 yards away no one saw anything come on now come on now <sighs> yet the defense has not located any interviews of the owners of the phones the defense has located no information or interviews contained in any of the investigative reports concerning any other person or persons whose phone numbers were identified on February 13th, 2017, as walking in or around the same area where the victims were ultimately located the next day. Again, someone in law enforcement summarised those movements by replicating them on a map, yet no narrative report can be found to explain why law enforcement reduced the movements to a map of the multiple people using multiple phones at or near the crime scene at the time the murders were purportedly committed. We don't believe that there was any sexual assault coming because there's no sexual assault charges. If they could prove sexual assault, then they'd be charged, there'd be a charge of sexual assault. While it's possible that the geofencing is not what it appears to be, or perhaps was later debunked in some document that has not yet been turned over to defence, the defence has found no documentation that dispels that the geofencing appears to be highly exculpatory in nature. The defence is attempting to verify what the geofencing evidence appears to show and based upon the map that tracks the movements of multiple people to verify what law enforcement also apparently believes the geofencing coordinates show. After the debacle involving the identity of the Purdue professor, <laughs> the defence has no faith at all 
that the prosecution will produce evidence such as geofencing analysis as required under local rule 08, etc. As detailed in the Franks Memorandum filed September 18th, 2023, as well as the defendant's additional Franks Mortis filed October 3rd, 2023, since August 10th, 2023, the defence has asked the prosecutor to identify the Purdue professor whose findings thwarted investigative efforts to look into Ordinism as being involved in the murders. According to Sergeant Jerry Holman, the Purdue professor had reviewed the arrangement of certain sticks left at the crime scene and concluded that the sticks found on the girls at the crime scene, according to Holman, did not represent Ordinism or any type of cult worshipping or any type of group that would have committed the crime. However, after his deposition, the defence sought the identity of this Purdue professor who altered the way that the case was investigated. No one from the prosecution or law enforcement claimed that they could remember this Purdue professor's name. After the defence made several requests from the, to the, from, from the prosecutor to identify the Purdue professor for purposes of conducting a deposition, the prosecutor sent an email to the defence on September 6th that read, As stated before, we are trying to identify the Purdue professor, but no luck yet. Oh, we'll keep looking though. Detective Holman has reached out to the FBI and Purdue and has not yet gotten a response. We will continue our endeavours, but may not be able to identify him or her. Map emoji, please. Yeah, we'll do a map emoji. This response from the prosecutor seemed utterly preposterous. It, it had been nearly a month since the defence first made its request for the prosecutor to identify the Purdue professor. And the state police, with all the response, the, while the resources at its uh, disposal claims that it was unable to identify the Purdue professor, even indicating that they may not ever be able to identify the Purdue professor. <laughs> the prosecutor's email seemed implausible. Yeah, no shit. The mere identity of the Purdue professor is considered discovery that should have been turned over to the defence. His name and reports should have been provided to the defence no later than December 14th, 2022, according to local rule. Yet, on September 6, 2023, the prosecutor told the defence that Jerry Ullman and the vast resources of the Indiana State Police could not figure out who this professor was nor did the prosecutor turn over any of the Purdue professor's reports. However, since getting back on the case, the defence has learned that Jerry Holman did in fact learn the identity of the Purdue professor, Jeffrey Turco, on August 12, 2023, through the Purdue Police Department. And Turco's identity was confirmed a few days later by other law enforcement. Holman even had possession of Turco's report, which contradicted Holman's August 10th, 2023 sworn testimony during this same time frame. So Holman lied. He lied on oath. The information contained in paragraph 55 above came directly from Jerry Holman's own report, prepared September 22nd, 2023, Holman's report was not made available to the defence until February 2024. Holman's September 22nd, 2023 report exposed the following concerning the state of Indiana's intentional violation of the discovery order due to their attempt to hide the identity of an exculpatory witness. Is the Flora 4 connected? Wouldn't surprise me. During the month of August 2023, the defence made multiple requests uh, for the state of Indiana to identify the Purdue professor. According to Jerry Holman and Tony Liggett, 
altered the way the case was investigated. By mid-August, Holman knew the identity of the Purdy professor, yet throughout all of August and September, McClelland told the defence on multiple occasions that Holman and all law enforcement could not figure out the identity of the Purdy professor. Aren't these guys meant to be investigators? They're meant to be detectives and they can't work out the name of one professor. They don't hold out much hope of actually solving crime, do they? McClellan's September 6 email to the defence detailing Ullman's inability to identify the Purdy professor was clearly not true. After the filing of the Franks memorandum on September 18th, Jerry Holman was forced to interview the Purdy professor before the professor learned that he was missing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Oh. Holman interviewed the Purdy professor the very next day. <laughs> No way. Holman's September 2022 report memorializes meeting with Turco. It's filled with multiple falsehoods and mischaracterizations concerning his conversation with Turco. In what appears to be an attempt to water down Tur Turco's actual opinion that it was a given that someone was trying to replicate a Germanic runic script, Holman memorialized Turco's conclusion as inconclusive. Despite how Holman drafted his report, Turco's conclusions were not inconclusive whatsoever. Turco was clear in that his opinion and that of a Harvard expert, the sticks found at the scene were an attempt to replicate a Germanic rune script. The only thing that Turco could not say for certain was the intended meaning of the persons who left the runic script at the crime scene. So they just weren't very good at, at writing runes, right? They had a go, but weren't very good. So amateurish. <sighs> Holman also attempted to deceive those reading his report when he, Holman, wrote in his report that Turco stated no evidence our research indicated that those involved in Odinism practices ritualistic human sacrifice. Holman chose not to include Turco's actual words that the stick configurations were pretty clearly runic and that he, Turco, could certainly imagine that this was somebody's idea that when you do human sacrifices, you carve runes or you, you fi figure them with sticks. There are some poetic sources that would sort of support that idea that somebody might have come across. That scenario seems entirely plausible to me. So that's Turco tape statement 15 to 1550. Even with minutes. Whereas Turco told Holman to his face that the people who placed these sticks on the girls clearly were attempting to create runes and that it was entirely plausible that the perpetrator would believe that after a human sacrifice, he or she should carve some runes. Holman attempted to deceive the reader of the report by implying that Turco totally disregarded that possibility of the involvement of human sacrifice. That is not what Turco said. Yeah, game over. The G offensing for me, that's game over. That's game over. His form wasn't there, it's game over. It wasn't there. All right. Holman certainly understood that on August 10th, 2023, he, Holman, did not tell the truth under oath at his deposition concerning the findings of the Purdy professor. Then tried to hide the identity of the Purdy professor while Holman was attempting to hide the identity of the Purdy professor. What Holman did not account for was that the Franks memorandum would be filed on September 18th. 
and the Franks memo would call out Holman and McClellan for claiming that they could not figure out the identity of the Purdue professor. I'm trying to figure out if there's one thing that is true on the state side. Oof. Well, the girls were murdered. That's one thing that's true. The girls were murdered. Everything else, you might as well just take everything we thought we knew and throw it all up in the air and just let it land. That would make more sense than what we currently have. Yeah, well, yeah, land growth is a crime, yeah. Furthermore, McClellan never once contacted the defence and alerted them that the Purdue professor had been found. Furthermore, McClellan has still never explained to the defence why he had sent an email on September 6 claiming that the identity of the Purdue professor was still unknown when it was later revealed that Holman had known the identity of the Purdue professor several weeks earlier. Additionally, McClellan never turned over the Purdue report until receiving an email from the defence requesting that he turn over the report. McClellan finally turned over the Purdue report on October 4th at 9.43pm via email, nearly 10 months after he was required to do so under local rules and well over a month after Holman had received the report in mid-August 2023. The Purdue report that the professor finally turned over to the defence further exposed the lack of veracity of Liggett's and Holman's August 2023 deposition testimony which further explained why Holman tried to hide the identity of the Purdy professor and the contents of his 2017 report. In addition to those discovery violations already identified, the state of Indiana has also failed to produce other evidence oh God, that the defence has had to either pursue on its own or make special requests from the prosecution. Some of this evidence includes, but not limited to, the following. Homer may have lied to Tricky Nicky. May have done, yeah. May have lied. We could give Nick the benefit of that out and say that it's Holman that's the liar. But why would why would he lie? Who would have who would have the most to lose? Holman or McClelland? I would say McClelland, however. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. There's, but there's more. All right. The faked crime scene image found on Brad Holder's Facebook page. The defense has traveled to Georgia. Oh, we heard this in the memo. Travel to Georgia to retrieve a copy of that image. To this day, the state of Indiana has not turned over a copy of said faked crime scene image, have, while having to admit in deposition testimony that it's real and was found on Brad Holder's Facebook page within weeks of the murders. He's, he's since taken it down. Since taken it down. Video of a ritual in Fort Wayne involving Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall, in which Westfall can be seen marking a tree using his hand at a similar height to that tree as the F was found on the tree at the crime scene. Well, Patrick Westfall has... We, we, that, that video, if it's the same... If it's the same one that they're talking about, is actually still on Brad Holder's Facebook. And you can see Patrick Westfall reach up and he said that he was putting a coin, like finding a little crevice in the tree to put a coin as like a gift to the gods. Can you do it if you're the jury? Is he guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, Paul? Yeah. Let's do that. 
so yeah we we do have that video if it's the same video so that's what he said he was doing all right start poll okay if you were a jury member based on oh it's not going to tell me so if you're a jury member would you find if you were a jury member would you find rick allen guilty or not guilty it doesn't give me enough characters to say oh i, I might do best um what you oh yeah it will okay if you were a jury member, based on what you know at the moment, would you find Rick Allen guilty or not guilty? Start poll. We'll look at that after. Have you done my poll? Has my poll gone in? Okay. Paul's gone in. All right. Yeah, Brad Holder is a mason. At Tipton Lodge, where Slicky Nicky got his Master Mason degree. Don't believe me. Screenshots are there. Put them in videos. They're all there. All right. After finding references to that ritualistic video in an email from Detective Greg Forensi to Tony Liggett, the defence had to ask for that video as the prosecution had not yet turned the video over to the defence. Could you just ask me, it's on Brad Alder's Facebook, that if it's the same video. The video was finally received on or about September 8th, around 10 months after the prosecutor was required to turn it over to the defence. Video of Elvis Field's interview was not turned over until September 8th. Video of Johnny Messer's interview not turned over until September 8th. Video of Rod Abram's interview not turned over till September 8th. Video of Ned Smith interview not turned over until September 8th. These attempts at concealing evidence at the hands of Holman and the prosecution detailed in this motion provides the underpinning to support the defence position that law enforcement and the prosecution continue to hide evidence from the defence and do not, oh, sorry, and do so without care or concern of any consequences from this court. No, because there's no consequences from the court towards Slick Nick because he's the golden boy. He doesn't need to be concerned about consequences because there are no consequences. She's got his back. I'll move my microphone back. Those whirring things in their ears. The defence recently filed its motion for early trial for several reasons, including concern for their client's safety and mental and physical health. Well, yeah. Anybody thinking that Rick Allen might not make it to May 13th? Is it on anybody's mind that Rick Allen might leave this mortal coil before May 13th? It's concerning me. The biggest concern that the defence has concerning the early trial request is the prosecution's continued violation of the discovery rules. The defence would therefore request the court to compel the state of Indiana and law enforcement to turn over all relevant evidence in its possession. Again, 
as a defence does not have the luxury of knowing what is in the state's possession, the defence can only specifically request discovery that the defence believes exists based on a common sense understanding of the evidence that they currently have in their possession and the evidence that should exist as an extension of the evidence that the defence already received. So, yeah, the geofencing. There's got to be reports connected to that geofencing map. You don't just do a map concerning geofencing. We know other reports, nothing. Oh, let's just do a map of some phones. All right, let's all do it. Let's just make it all up. No, there is there is reports. There will be multiple people who've worked on that geofencing. Where's that evidence? Thank you, Jazz King, for the five dollars. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Paul's unanimous, is it? There you go. If you guys were the jury, Rick would be walking. Oh, no, not quite. 95%. 95%. We've got one dissenter, maybe. All right, let's finish this uh, thing. The defence is requesting the court to compel the state of Indiana to turn over to the defence by no later than Monday, March 18th, all evidence. Oh, oh, that's D-Day. Oh, March 18th. It's the day of the contempt hearing, isn't it? All evidence that it may have in its possession but has failed to turn over, including the following. All reports that detail how certain videos that should have been found on the hard drive labeled Delphi DVR original. <laughs> <laughs> that were purportedly de deleted between February 13th and February 20th, 2017, including deleted videotaped interviews of Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall. That would include any reports that detail how the erased videos were discovered, what attempts were made to retrieve the erased videos, an explanation for how the deleted videos were erased, and any attempt to contact the subjects of the erased interviews for re-interview. <laughs> All reports that detail how certain audio is missing in certain videos. So there's no audio missing. So we've now got videos with no audio. Oh, my God. All reports that detail how certain audio is missing in certain videos found on a hard drive labeled Delphi DVR original, in which the video is present but audio is not. The defence would further request all reports that detail why, why there is not audio, what efforts have been made to retrieve the audio, and any attempts at recreating the audio by re-interviewing those seen but not heard on the video. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. The identity of all persons whose interviews were erased, as detailed in paragraph 69A above, and also the identity of all persons who are viewed on all videos in which there is no audio, as detailed in paragraph 69b. Similarly, the state of Indiana provided hard drive, Delphi DVR Drive 1 export, in which the state of Indiana claims that there is no detectable audio in the original drive from which the duplicate was made. The defence requests the court to compel the state of Indiana to identify all persons viewed on this hard drive in which no audio is available, as well as a synopsis of what was said on the missing audio. This is just craziness. As it, did nobody notice that there's no audio? Or was the audio, oh, look, the audio was deleted. Oh, 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 no, sorry. The mics weren't working that day. Come on. 
On hard drive, Delphi DVR Drive 1 export, it appears that a sketch artist met with a lady and then sketched out an image of a male. The defence has never seen this sketch, nor has the prosecutor produced this sketch to the defence. So there's another sketch? There's another sketch? The defence requests the name of the female who appears to provide the information that resulted in the sketch, as well as all documents of the sketch artist that the defence has seen other sketch artists produce in other sketches. Oh, they won't have that report either. If it doesn't look like Richard Allen, they won't have that report either. I can guarantee you that. And the substance of that conversation between the sketch artist and the lady providing the information on all law enforcement reports detailing why law enforcement asked this witness to provide information for a sketch artist. So the defence doesn't know who this person is who's done a sketch that they haven't seen. And <laughs> Gull will end up back in the hospital. <laughs> I think we'll all end up in the hospital here. And Rick Allen will end up in the morgue. I hope I'm wrong. I sincerely, sincerely hope I'm wrong. Oh, man. Furthermore, the defence requests the court to compel the state of Vienna to produce the sketch itself. All of Derek German's law enforcement interviews, including video, audio and or notes reports memorialising any, any law enforcement interview. If he was never interviewed, the defence would ask for confirmation of that fact. So for those not in the know, Derek German is Libby's dad. They've got to have interviewed Derek German. Come on now. So he was the one who went to pick Abby and Libby up and couldn't find them. So he walked down, he walked down, he parked at the Mears farm. He walked down right along the trail. Somebody was coming up the other way. And he, he said, have you seen two girls like coming up from the bridge area? And this guy said, no. So this guy carried on. So Derek, De Derek German didn't go down to the bridge. He went down the other trail, which takes you down to the creek. So there's two trails, one that takes you to the bridge, one that takes you down to the creek, to the, like, the side of the creek so you can walk along the bank. So Derek German went down to the creek, had a look there, still couldn't find them. So he walked back up and he went, he, he walked back towards the Freedom Bridge, didn't find them there, so walked back to his car. So Derek German was like, I suppose, the first person to realise that the girls were missing. So they got to have interviewed him. Now, I bet his was one that got erased because surely he would have been one of the first people that was interviewed. So he his would have been one of them that was, a, that was erased when, you know, they left the tape running and it overrode itself. I would imagine that that's what happened. However, if there's no like, who else? Who else was interviewed in that week? The, 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 you know, the, could have been there at the scene, could have seen something, could have heard something and was and the defence has no idea about. Truth and justice seems to be a joke. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. For purposes of establishing a timeline, all of Kelsey German's phone dumps and all phones attributable to Kelsey German. If her phone was never collected, the defence would request confirmation of this fact. Furthermore, every law enforcement interview of Kelsey German include... So they've not even got Kelsey's interview. So for those not in the know, Kelsey dropped the girls off at Mia's farm and then went to meet her boyfriend, I think. We know Kelsey was interviewed. We we know we know they were all interviewed. We know they were interviewed. We know they were interviewed. 
including video audio and any other notes reports memorializing so if she was never in we know she was interviewed she said she was interviewed we know we know all the family were it we know all of cody patty's phone dump so cody patty is libby's adopted uncle i think becky patty adopted him or something uh, so, all of Cody Patty's phone dumps, of all phones attributable to Cody Patty, if his phone was never collected, blah, blah, blah. So, they've not even got anything from Cody either. Any law enforcement interview from Cody? No, they've not got that either. Okay, all right, not got that. Not got any of that. There are two images that exist, but which the state of Indiana has not turned over to the defence. Those images can be found on the internet, with at least one of these images seemingly adopted by law enforcement as being legitimate, as it has been utilised by law enforcement in various media appearances, including a 2019 press conference. We are talking about the photo of Abby Williams walking on the bridge purportedly taken at 207. Attributable to be sent via Snapchat from Liberty Germans form. Also, the image of the morning high bridge at 205. So we know that they've not got those either. We know they exist. Related to those items, the defense would like to ask the court to compel the state of Indiana for the following that so far has not been produced. Interviews are reports of Kyle Smith or anyone else that received either or both images taken on the bridge reportedly at 205 and 207 purportedly from Libby's Snapchat so Kyle Smith was a friend of Abby and Libby all reports analysis and documentation detailing any information about the images purportedly taken at 205 and 207 all reports documentation and analysis from Snapchat or any law enforcement agency dealing with the data confirming when those images were taken. So they don't even know. See, the, 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 the important thing is for the timeline, right, when, were, when was, because we've just assumed, right, we've assumed that the Morning Bridge was taken at 205 and that the photo of Abby was taken at 207. And then the bridge guy video was taken at 2.13. We've assumed that because we've assumed that people have seen the metadata. We've assumed that Snapchat has, you know, you can, you can go into the metadata of a Snapchat photo and you can look at when it was taken when it was well yeah because it's snapchat yeah you snap it don't you and can you I'd, i've not had snapchat for years it would have been it would have been before 2017 when i deleted snapchat because it got on my nerves i would say i had snapchat about 2013 so i don't know what function snapchat has you know increased but you used to when Snapchat first came out, you used to have to like snap your photo right there. Like you couldn't upload a photo to Snapchat and send it. You had to take it and then it was sent immediately and then it erased after like 10 seconds or something. I know it's kind of changed now, <clears throat> but I don't know what state it was in in 2017. I don't know, Christy, that's what I'm saying. Like on, on like Instagram or uh, whatever YouTube, whatever you can either take a photo, take a photo with the app, or you can, <clears throat> or you can upload one. Like on TikTok, you can take a video or a photo using the app itself. So the the time that will be in the metadata of that photo or video will be the time it was taken by, by TikTok. So TikTok will have that metadata. However, you can upload a video 
or a foot. I don't think you can vote. Yeah, I don't know whether you can upload a photo to TikTok. I think you can. So you could have taken that video a year ago and you can still upload it as a video to TikTok. So the metadata on TikTok will be when it was uploaded, not when it was taken, if that makes sense. I don't know about Snapchat, though. <clears throat> yeah, my voice is going. I've got Pepsi Max by the side of me. I, I do keep having a drink, but it's not helping much. It's because I'm shouting. We're nearly finished, though, now. So I, I don't know about Snapchat. <clears throat> because if the if the if you have to take the photo using the app then the time on that photo will be stored by snapchat because it won't actually be on the phone unless i think i don't remember whether you could you could give snapchat the option if you wanted to to save the photos you took on your phone anyway i don't know the answer but they've surely got to have that information the the prosecution will have that information it's crazy that that information would be some of the first information that was in the crime, in the file for this crime. And yet, the defence, it's like over seven years, seven years, and the defence still doesn't have it. Crazy. Crazy. Insane. All reports, documentation and analysis from Snapchat or any other law enforcement agency dealing with the data confirming when those images were taken, where they were taken and how they were distributed, including all reports related to the data and metadata. Should be a given that that's, that's just part of the discovery. Any analysis related to those images that have been conducted by law enforcement agency or any other person, governmental or private entity, that has worked with law enforcement. If the state of Indiana does not believe that the image of Abby walking on the bridge at 207 and the bridge taken at 205 are discoverable because the state of Indiana does not claim those images are relevant or reliable, then the defence requests confirmation of the same. I would imagine that they are very relevant because both of those photos, you cannot see anyone in the background. So where did BG come from? I mean, yeah, there is enough time if you're very confident on the bridge <clears throat> to come from, you know, the trees on the north side and bomb it over the bridge to be behind abby at 213 yeah you, you, you can if you're very confident walking on that bridge you know if you're used to walking on that you know that trestle but the defense are going to be you know they're going to show it to the jury and say look can you see anybody in those photos or are you saying that you know he came from literally nowhere from the other side and he walked over um how long do you think it would take to walk over I mean, you can't even do the test now because they've changed the bridge. Like the first half of the bridge now is new and, you know, safe with, with a fence. So it's not like you can go there now and test it. Interesting why they've done that, isn't it? I'm sure it's all to do with safety. I'm sure it's all to do with safety. I'm sure it is. All right. All reports and or documents, including phone dumps from any phone or electronic device that was believed to possibly be a phone or electronic device of either victim used near the Morning High Bridge or in any area that was geofenced near the Morning High Bridge that was identified as a victim form that is different than the form found at the crime scene. Ha! Huh. So are they saying that there might be another victim form? 
Is that what they're saying? All emails be be between Professor Turkor or any law enforcement officer from 2017 to present. Oh, they'll, they'll have lost all their emails. I can, I can guarantee they'll have lost all their emails. All reports, documentations, notes, or any analysis of geofencing data related to this case. The identity of the person or persons, presumably law enforcement, that labelled the geofencing data, including labelling a second form as geofence victim. So there was another form. There was another phone at the crime scene. So did Abby have a phone after all? If so, where is that phone? That was not the phone belonging to Libby. Geofencing, is that even a real thing? Yes, it's a real thing. Yeah. It's done that pretty much on pretty much every case now, geofencing. Very common. <clears throat> <clears throat> the identity of the person or persons, presumably law enforcement, that reduced the geofencing coordinates of multiple forms on February 13th between 12.39 and 54 seconds. That's so precise, like down to the very second. 12.39 and 54 seconds. Was that when Richard Allen left by any chance? I don't know. And 5.49 and 23 seconds. Wouldn't you just round it up to 12.40? That's like six seconds away from 12.40. Why wouldn't you do it like 12.30 to 6? Like, that's weird. It's weird to a map tracking the various forms on the date between those times. All interviews, reports, documents, or memorialization of interviews of anyone whose phone was found through geofencing in or around the crime scene at the time law enforcement is claiming that the murders took place. Afternoon of February 13th, 2017. <laughs> you need at least 12 more beers to let this sink in. Well, I bet Slick Nick's going to need a beer when he reads this. He's going to need to drown his sorrows. 12.39 was when Kelsey originally said she dropped the girls off. No, it wasn't 12.39. It was, um, she originally said 1.39. Oh, oh, 1.38. And then it turned out that it was we we in the PCA it turned out to be one forty nine I think. It was one wearing a Fitbit? Did Fitbits exist in twenty seventeen? Maybe they did. I think it was Libby's real phone. The planted phone was the one under the girls. Uh, I think they'd be able to determine that that was actually Libby's phone that was under Abby. I think her family would probably know that that was her phone. Okay. All right, where were we? All right, all reports of all leaked investigation. <laughs> Here's the killer paragraph writing at the end. All reports of all leak investigations not related to the Mitch Westerman leak investigations, including any reports made by Nick McClelland of content providers reaching out to him, claiming that they were in possession of leaked information and which McClelland then ordered the content provider to delete the images. <laughs> Uh, no. 
The defence further requests that the state of Indiana be sanctioned for the variety of discovery violations. I would say the sanctions should be, I don't know, 20 lashes or, I don't know, uh, maybe maybe a, a, a week in Wabash or something. <laughs> oh, dear. Be sanctioned for the variety of discovery violations detailed in this document. Specifically, the defence requests that should any violations result in the need for a continuance of the early trial in order to, order to or evaluate late discoverable evidence that the time be applied against the state of Indiana and not Richard Allen? And there it is. That's it. All done. Andrew Baldwin has written that. Oh, and he's <laughs> he's made sure he's made sure that paragraph sixty nine is not ignored. Well, and there it is. Wow. When you think the Delphi case becomes, you know, just about as insane as a case can be, it then it then surprises me once again. That G offence in for me, that that has blown my mind. That has blown my mind. If Richard Allen's phone or any form possibly attributable to Richard Allen in February of 2017, if that was not there, he was not there. Unless his form was there and then it suddenly disappeared when he turned it off. But no, it was not there. That's done it for me. That has done it for me. <sighs> Delphi Docs has been adding docs since you went live. Oh my God, have they? Hold on. What else has come out? I don't think I can bear to read any more tonight. My voice is getting very. Hold on. All right. Delphi Docs. <laughs> oh, no. All right, so I've read that. So this is it, right. More incoming. Motion filed. Motion for specific findings of fact and conclusions thereon. Petition filed. Verified petition for recusal. <laughs> <clears throat> From contempt proceedings. Motion to stay all auxiliary proceedings and get this case to trial. Any more? Just those three. <laughs> I do like this uh, subreddit. I'm going to have to quit my job to stay up to date with all this crap. <laughs> oh, it's not crap, I promise you. Oh, no. What does the second one mean? <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Links to docs and comments. All right. So I'm not going to read any more of these tonight. Don't, please don't try and persuade me. All right, so we've got additional list of exhibits for contempt hearing. All 
I'm going to have to take a peek at this, but objection to change of venue. So all these are coming today. Additional list of exhibits for contempt hearing. Objection to change of venue. Verified petition for recusal of prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> Motion for specific findings of fact. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at that. Recusal of prosecutor. Can you see that? No, you can't see it. There, you can see it now. All right. How long is it? Oh, it's a long one. Oh, go on! I'll read it. I'll, 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 I'll not read every word. All right. So, uh, respectfully petitions the court to recuse <laughs> Prosecutor McClelland from any contempt proceedings. January twenty ninth, the elected prosecutor of Carroll County filed a verified information of contemptuous conduct. All of the alleged acts or omissions in that pleading are more than a year old. That pleading was filed the day after Attorney Baldwin and Rosie were reinstated. Mr. McClellan made no effort to seek punishment for defence counsel in the intervening one year. Whether defence counsel were disqualified or not, if Mr. McClellan truly felt they should be punished for acts and omissions, he would have filed his pleading sooner. Absolutely. Facts and circumstances of the filing, the delay, the timing, blah, blah, blah. The allegations are frivolous and unfounded. Mr. McClelland accessed, read, and quoted a defence pleading that was filed ex parte. And we talked about this. We talked about this in the last video on Delphi. Mr. McClelland's theory on one of his accusations is that the defence counsel should have voluntarily communicated with him and the court on accidentally misdirected email. Yet he did not voluntarily report. He had access to an ex parte pleading to Shay. That's brilliant. Despite Mr. McClellan's protestations of an innocent mistake in a later filing. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did. He did. Yes, he did. Mr. McClellan is a lawyer with nearly 15 years experience and knew or should have known that ex parte means not to be accessed by or shared by opposing counsel. Thank you. We are dust for the five pounds. You are so kind. Thank you. Thank you. The concept of innocent mistakes by attorneys will be part of the evidence at any contempt hearing. Mr. McClelland has communicated with a person that has confidential information, which they publicly disseminated and claimed who their source was. But Mr. McClelland did not report that information or direct anyone to investigate it. Those exchanges will be evidence at any contempt hearing. This is not a threat. This is a promise. Prior to filing his request for contempt, Mr. McClelland had not received or reviewed all of the results and re interviews related to his accusations. That will be part of the evidence at any contempt hearing. Mr. McClelland was present at unrecorded conferences with the court that impact his allegations and will be part of the evidence at any contempt hearing. He will be called as a witness to corroborate the testimonies of other witnesses. <laughs> Mr. McClellan will be called as witness at any contempt hearing. He has been so advised yet has not withdrawn as counsel. So he's going to be counsel for the state and he's going to be a witness at his own contempt hearing. <laughs> he's going to have to cross-examine himself. <laughs> this is just nuts. This is crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> This is crazy. Mr. McClellan will be called as a witness at any contempt hearing. He's been so advised yet has not withdrawn as counsel. 
<laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> this needs to be televised. Sadly, no, it's not going to be televised. Sadly, no. I mean, they could, they could, <laughs> they could air it on the comedy channel because this is nothing more than comedy now. I don't look at any of the others. I don't look or else I'm going to end up reading them and my voice is literally just about to go. So let's have a look at these poll results. Let's have a look. End poll. So we've got 395, 396 votes. So whoever got that in right at the end did so just in time. So if you were a jury member, based on what you know at the moment, would you find Rick Allen not guilty 86% and guilty 13%? So Rick Allen would be walking home. He'd be walking home, wouldn't he? Well, I mean, it's not unanimous, but those that say he's guilty, I think probably that one or two people who make up that 13% could be swayed by argumentation. Yeah, exactly. Wake up people, you can be next. This could happen to anybody. This could happen to anybody. All right. On that note, I'm going to go and rest my voice. And I'm going to go and read these other documents. So if you want to read them all, I will put this link in the chat. So this is Delphi Docs on Reddit. So there you go. Anybody just wants to grab that link, it will take you straight over to um, Delphi Docs on Reddit. You don't have to be a member or anything like that. It's all free. You can just click the link and it will take you straight to it. So you don't even have to join up or anything like that. So it's all fine. All right, guys, I'm going to go rest my voice. Thank you all for joining me it's absolutely maddening it's it's upsetting it's at, at times it's comedy but it's just so sad it's so sad for the families for the for the justice system for rick i, I just can't i just i just want to curl up and cry for rick honestly i really do my stone cold heart is bleeding right now for rick allen it really is. Anyhow, all right. Thank you all. Thank you to the, those that donated. Welcome to the new members. I will see you all later. Thank you to the mods, if there was any mods in. Thank you so much for your continued work on the channel. I'd give you a free membership. If you're a mod, I'd give you a free membership, but I can't. YouTube doesn't give me the opportunity to do that. I'd like to do that to mods. So that's another thing that I want YouTube to listen to. Why can we not give our mods a free membership? But we can't. It's not allowed. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day or the evening reading the rest of those filings. And I shall see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.